Mary Magdalene interviews Jesus on the subject of resistance to humility. The interview took place in Wondai, Queensland, Australia, on the 5th of September, 2012. This is session five. I think yes. we mentioned earlier. Yeah. So to start off today, I wanted to ask you about fear and specifically this idea of living in fear. Yes, I feel fear is one of the most difficult emotions that people have to process and also is one of the biggest resistances that a person has to being humble. Today, it's sort of taken as a negative if you feel afraid about anything. Mm. And yet the world and, and people in it are full of fear about everything. Yeah. But, but we continuously try to satisfy this fear by creating safety or creating security which really is a way of uh, making out the fear is not there and and as soon as this safety or security is taken away the fear is exposed and if persons uh, looked at that really what we're doing is we're living in fear mm. we're not actually feeling the emotion of fear what we're doing is we're we're honoring our fear holding it within us and then asking the environment to pander to the fear that we have inside of ourselves. Mm -hmm. If we truly want to be free and also truly want to be humble, we need to actually go through the process of feeling the fear rather than living in the fear. And this is very, very difficult if we are justifying to ourselves that the fear exists or we're minimizing to ourselves that, oh, yes, I have some fear, but it doesn't really have that a large impact on my life. Uh, or I'm shifting the blame of our fear. Oh, you caused my fear all the time. Like, you, you made me afraid, and so now I can be angry with you, or now I can just reject you from my life because you've made me afraid. And these kind of attitudes towards our fear cause us to deny our fear. We, and I think that was one of the points we generally covered last week was denial. Yes. But, but what we're doing now is looking at if we deny our fear, we will live in it we will actually create a life where all of our fears, or as many of them as possible, are um, satisfied by some kind of safety or security thing that we, we need to go through. So, so for example, on the earth today, you've got people who are afraid of financial insecurity. So what they do is they create a financial buffer. Mm -hmm. So in the Western world, many people are very interested in not living to week, week to week anymore because, of, because they feel they need this financial buffer. And, and so what they do is they save up money and they place that money in the bank. And of course, this allows our funds to be misused in all sorts of ways, but, but it all is driven by this underlying fear. And if you take the money away from them out of the bank, it's a major disaster mm -hmm. in their life, which means that the fear itself hasn't actually gone. It's still present. And, and, it, and in fact, we finish up attracting events to trigger the presence of the fear inside of ourselves because God wants us to release it. God wants us to have no fear inside of our soul. But while we have this fear, we are and we're living in it and justifying it, minimizing it and shifting the blame of it onto other people, we are in reality justifying or, or in fact, like I've said to you many times in our private discussions, we're placing our fear as our God. Like God, instead of God being the God and all of God's laws being important, our fear becomes the most important thing. And we're willing to do anything else in our life until our fear is triggered, if that's the proper word, or exposed. And as soon as our fear is exposed, our fear becomes God. And w whatever integrity we had just flew out the window, whatever courage we had just flew out the window, and whatever of these other very beautiful qualities that we have, love, kindness, compassion, and all these other qualities, all of them flew out, fly out the window as well while we were living in this place. And, and in the end, we're just living honoring our own fear rather than actually feeling the fear itself and going through the process of releasing it by experiencing it properly. So it sounds like what you're saying, when I live in fear, I allow the avoidance of my fear or the prevention of my fear to guide and direct just about everything and 
and it's only when fear is I've done that enough that fear is absent that then my my higher ideals might come into play so my desire for God or my desire to love or be good or give yeah um, so what does well, it I, was, I think it's good to say at this point yeah. and uh, uh, is that um, when you live in your fear desire is also suppressed mm. And this is a very important thing because because desire is the source of most of our happiness. So if we're suppressing our desire because we're afraid, then of course we're also suppressing the potential of our own happiness because of, we're afraid. So, so for example, if, uh, if a person's living in a relationship that they're not happy with, uh, but they're afraid to leave because of security reasons, if financial or physical security reasons, then they are going to be a very hap unhappy, suppressed individual while they remain in that particular relationship. Unless the source of their unhappiness uh, changes. In other words, unless the other person in the relationship changes what they do, they are going to remain very unhappy. They've now made their life entirely dependent upon the other person's choice to be loving, which is not a very wise thing to do in the long run. But also they've made their own happiness dependent uh, and also they've made their own happiness almost impossible because they're suppressing their fear of the financial insecurity, of the physical insecurity. They're suppressing this fear by staying. But when you suppress one emotion like fear, you are also going to suppress desire. And actually fear itself suppresses desire. Mm -hmm. So while I am so afraid, I am not going to feel any desire. This is one reason why many women in their relationships do not feel sexual desire, because they have a lot of deep underlying fears that they're suppressing through the relationship, such as, such as financial and physical security issues, and they're using the relationship to suppress those particular things, but while their fear is being suppressed, their desire, their, even their sexual desire, will also be suppressed. So it's a, it's a source of much unhappiness on the planet, this, this living in fear and using the external environment to suppress the feeling of fear rather than just going through and experiencing the feeling of fear. Mm -hmm. And it's also a major impediment to a person being humbled to receiving any truth because every single time they want to justify the retaining of their own fear. Mm -hmm. You know, you think of how many conversations we've had where you've wanted to justify mm -hmm. why you should be afraid and why I should honour that fear that you have. Absolutely. And, and the majority of people that we meet are very similar. They want to justify why they shouldn't have to be loving in certain circumstances. They want to justify why they shouldn't have to do certain things. And even then, things that are blatantly unloving, they will justify because their fear has become their God. Yes. Yeah, yeah I, I, certainly I relate to that from my own experience. But also something that surprises me as I go on and I do, I am beginning to face more fears is how much I really, you mentioned that so many people are unhappy. I really equated happiness with feeling comfortable and safe. Mm -hmm. and, and I was actually quite unhappy, but mm -hmm. I, I understood this feeling to be happiness. And it's only as I begin to challenge more fears and strive for humility that I find, oh no, there's joy in happiness. There's, there's mm -hmm. this other quality that was missing in my life. I feel more alive. Mm -hmm. um, and many people I, I observe are just walking through life thinking, oh, this is happiness. And mm -hmm. it's almost like they've settled for something less than alive because mm -hmm. they just equate safety with happiness. Yes, and also fear is a, a great excuse for not acting. Yeah. Like, so most people you know, a lot of our joy comes from our actions, from, from what we decide to do with our life and what we finish up creating because we do. And when we are in a process of feeling, uh, not feeling our fear, but living in our fear, what we finish up doing is we finish up suppressing this desire to act. Mm -hmm. And so we finish up having a life where we are very stagnant in our life where we do the same things every day, it's quite boring, we only do what's safe, we, only, we don't extend ourselves in any way, we, we are unable to grow. And if, if we do not grow, we can't be happy either, by the way. And in addition, uh, there's this other problem, and that is fear prevents us from accepting truth. Because fear tells us that the false belief is true. Mm -hmm. and, and it doesn't matter what fear we have, 
whenever we have this feeling of fear, it is telling us that the false belief is true. And, and what I see people often doing with their fear is they're justifying to themselves that their fear is true constantly. And they're telling themselves that their fear is the truth. Like most women tell themselves that they should be afraid of men mm. as if that is a truth, mm. right? And they act like that's a truth. Now, many of the women have never been harmed by men most of their life, many of these same women who are afraid. Now, there are some women who are afraid and of course, this, because they have, have actually been harmed by men. And of course, all the other women look at that and then they go, oh, they've been harmed so I could be harmed, mm -hmm. not understanding how harm actually is created or any of those kind of things. And, and in the process of doing that, this, they decide that their fear is justified. It's important to be afraid of men, right? And you must hold on to this fear of men. And many men do the same thing with women, of course, with different beliefs, but they're just based on fear. So many men who have an attractive woman as a wife or a partner, they're afraid that she will go off with somebody else because they underlying all of that is their own fear that they don't have the worth to actually keep the woman that, that they're with. And that underlying suppression of this fear causes them to live in a state of jealousy. Mm -hmm. and, and we see these kind of things happening all the time. And the reason why is because the fear itself causes us to be totally blocked to truth because we're actually believing a different truth than what is God's truth. So, you know, and I put the different truth in quotation marks because it's not really a truth. And even right down to the fear of death, you know, we believe death is a traumatic experience. We believe, you know, many people are afraid because they do not believe there is any such thing as a life after death. And so they see death as the termination of their complete existence. And the other people who do not believe that um, have no determin determined or, or clear viewpoint of what their life after death would be like, and so they are very afraid of it. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, we fear death so much. We'll do almost anything to avoid death. In fact, the majority of people will do anything to avoid death. If it means, you know, allowing themselves to, you know, be raped or, 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 or you know, lying or stealing or cheating or w w all of these other things on, on other people, if they're, if they're faced with death, they'll do it most of the time. And then if they won't do it for the facing of their own death, they certainly will do it for the facing of a death of someone they love. Yes. And, and this is all an indication of a false belief that they're living in every single day. And so, People who live in fear, who live in false beliefs every day, are easily manipulated. You can, a, an external person or a society can manipulate that individual into doing whatever the society or external person wants them to do. So it's not a state of freedom either. It's a state where you're allowing manipulation because you're afraid. And all a person has to do is trigger that fear or, or, or expose that fear and all of a sudden you'll act a certain way. This, you know, this is how, uh, we, you and I have noticed recently how many adverts there are on television for cleaners that clean 99.99% of the germs. Yeah. Like, uh, there's still 0.01% of the germs and it only takes one germ to get into your body and, and at the end of the day you're still going to get something. Um, but, but there's this, there's this um, feeling in people that, oh, well, you know, so what's the fear? The fear of being sick, the fear of, you know, having a life interrupted through sickness or whatever. And this fear, not understanding the truth that all sickness is created through something that's going on of denial in the soul, not understanding that truth, they then, oh, that's the point, I, you know, that's the, yeah. that's the product I have to buy, you know, yeah. because that, that's going to give me the most feeling of security. Not realising in that moment they're buying a product that is only to avoid their fear mm. of perhaps becoming sick. Mm. So if we can just rewind a little bit to some of the things you've just mentioned, mm -hmm. um, because I, I feel there's, when you say that fear is not real, and, and then at another point you talked about people justifying their fear, are you saying that when we understand truth, there will be nothing adverse that will happen in our life? Is, is no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that if, if, we under, if we are in a state of complete love, and that is a state of one with God, which means we are also in a state of understanding the truth about a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And it's not understanding the truth about everything mm -hmm. at that point, because there's still many truths to learn. 
But once we're in the state of complete love, fear itself does not exist to us. It doesn't mean that we won't attract events that, uh, because of other people and what they choose to do, that, that events might not come to us that, that the average person would be afraid of. Mm -hmm. But we just will not feel afraid of it. Mm -hmm. that, that, and therefore, we will attract less events. We may still have events happening to us that other people would be afraid of, but the reality is we would not feel afraid in exactly the same circumstances. Mm -hmm. So if there's a spirit influenced person in a rage with us, looking like they with a knife in their hand and, and looking like you know they're going to do something with that knife, we, we won't feel afraid in that state. Right? We'll know exactly the things that we need to say or do to, to ensure that the situation remains safe. And if we can't maintain the safety, we're not afraid of our own death. We're not afraid of being hurt because we can heal ourselves, but we're also not afraid of dying because we know there's no such thing as dying. And we're not afraid of the pain either because we know we can manage pain in that state. So, so there is nothing to be afraid of literally in that state. Uh, and so we're not afraid of violence anymore. So someone can threaten us with violence, but it has no effect on us. Mm -hmm. If we're living in fear, it's completely different. In the same situation, if we're living in fear, we'd go, man's got a knife, I need a, something to protect myself, I need to run or I need to, or I need to attack. And often this is what does cause us to attack. You know, if I've got a gun, I'll pull it out and shoot him because he was going to attack me. And, and these are all actions based around now our fear of our own death, our fear of our own being harmed or someone we love being harmed. And these fears are now driving our actions. So, so basically, from what you're saying, when we justify fear, we will never reach the state that you're describing now because we will never enter into a process of feeling it, we will live in it. Yeah. Is that what you mean when you say fear is not real? Because certainly it's an emotion that exists, isn't it? Yes, um, please understand when I say that fear is not real, I'm not saying that it's not an emotion that exists within the person, because it certainly is mm -hmm. an emotion that exists in the person, but it's just not real for God, from God's perspective. The emotion was created by a false belief or a lack of love sometime in their history. Mm -hmm. So from God's perspective, the emotion of fear was created by a false belief perpetrated against the child or an emotion of a lack of love perpetrated towards the child that causes the child now to believe that its fear is real. From God's perspective, the fear is not real. It's not the truth. Mm -hmm. There's nothing the child actually needs to be afraid of, right? But nothing at all, in fact. But the child is going to feel afraid while it's had these unloving and untruthful things perpetrated against it until it releases it. So the fear exists as re in reality inside the individual, but from God's perspective, it is not the truth about the situation, but the person believes it's the truth about the situation. Yes, yeah, I see that. There's an error in perception, can mm -hmm. we call it that? Mm -hmm. But if we can just be, I really want to be hone in on this issue. Well, one of the reasons why, though, is because you're, you're still going through this process emotionally of coming to accept that the fear is not real. And, and I see it reflected <laughs> around me also. Yeah, yeah. So um, we can move on from there. No, no, and just, no, no. But I just know it's that... It's an important question because most people, people believe those. the fear is real. Yes. And so therefore they act upon it, they live in it, they do not do anything about experiencing it, they don't go through the emotional experience of feeling it. Yeah. yeah. So if you, if you give the example of the small boy who is in a situation where there's a lack of love, perhaps there's violence in his parents mm -hmm. around him, mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned that from God's perspective he has nothing to fear. No. Okay. So what is happening can in I that straight, situation? Can I say yeah. why? Yeah. If the boy is harmed in any way, then most of the time his spirit friends will help him go out of his body while he's being harmed, so there'd be very little physical pain associated with the harm. Secondly, God is always trying to help the individual themselves, even if they are a child, to, to, to avoid the pain of being harmed by others. Mm -hmm. and, and so that, you know, that's something that God will, uh, will support the spirits who, who are guiding the child in doing. Mm -hmm. In addition, um, if the child does pass, the child will be in a very loving place in the spirit world. The child has nothing to fear about its future. So it has nothing to fear that it's not going to be loved. And it, but unfortunately, the child believes it's not going to be loved because it's told it's not going to be loved by the parents. 
And because of the parents' belief systems that there is no afterlife or there is no future, of course the child also feels that uh, as a truth. And so, so the child is afraid in a violent situation because the child has already been taught the truth, soul to soul, from the parents to the child. The child naturally now is afraid of the situation. If, if the child has had no emotional injuries in the situation, if the child had not have this, did not have this belief that if it died it was going to be dead forever, if it did not have the belief that it would be unloved, then the child would not actually feel afraid in the situation of violence. That's the reality. But the reason why the child does feel afraid is because it already has all of these beliefs inside of it that it obtained from the parents from the moment of conception onwards. And so all of these beliefs colour the child's perspective of what is real. Mm-hmm. And, and what the child sees is real is not what God sees is real. Right? Now there's usually nothing the child can do about it as a child, but there is certainly many things we can do about it as an adult. As an adult, we can choose to experience the fears that have been placed upon us by our parental and our environment during the time we were growing up. We can choose to experience them and release them and not live in them anymore. That will give us this sense of complete freedom and help us to absorb the truth. And the truth will set us free. Mm -hmm. The truth will set us free from any of these um, feelings that cause us to feel like we are constrained in Mm -hmm. any way. It will allow us to also follow our desires and passions without restriction Mm because fear places a restriction. And so if we allow ourselves to see that the only reason why even the child is afraid in any situation is because it already has the same societal and parental false beliefs that the parents and society have within themselves. And these false beliefs have also now entered the child. And that is the reason why the child is afraid. If we could, as adults, release these fear-based emotions, the next generation of children would have less fear. And eventually we'd get to a, a generation of children that had no fear at all. right? No fear in them whatsoever. Even if somebody was angry or upset, they'd still not be afraid. They would not even expect anybody to ever attack them. And as a result of that, there'd be less people who would attack them as well. And so they, they would be in this complete state of freedom. Now, that's the gift we can give to the next generation if we choose to experience our fear rather than live in it. When we live in it, we have no uh, way to give a gift to the next generation. In fact, what we're doing is we're giving the next generation the same impediment that we ourselves have been given by our own previous by the previous generation. Mm. Mm. Okay. Well, um, obviously, from what we've discussed, many people are living in fear, mm-hmm. uh, and many, I suppose, such as myself, uh, as I was, living in a lot of fear and not even recognising that fear was really guiding the avoidance of fear was guiding everything in my life. So, what are some what are some clues or tips that how can we if I'm such a person and I think I hear Jesus talking about living in fear how would I come to recognize I might be living in fear well with all emotions that exist within us we have to go through a process of realization of what's within us now the only way that we can really do that is firstly intellectually accepting that there probably is some fear within us so if we if we at the beginning believe there is no fear within us well, I feel that is a state of complete delusion. Like, but but, and many of us are li- many people on the planet are living in that state of complete delusion. Mm-hmm. But once we allow just even the intellectual thought that perhaps there is fear within us, the way that God's laws work is we our soul then starts to attract through through the law events that show us what our fears actually are, at least at an intellectual level. Once our fears are exposed at an intellectual level, um, we can at least now be conscious that we have them. And once we start looking at the fact that we have them, we can now start allowing ourselves to feel about having them and feel and allow ourselves to have the experience of having them. 
the problem there, unfortunately, though, is that we've been taught from a very young age, because of the society and our parents as well denying their own fears, we've been taught from a very young age that the important thing in life is to deny that you have any fear. And so once we start feeling or experiencing the fear that we actually have, we're going to go through probably a process of being attacked by the world around us and our parental system, we, even as an adult, because they will say, no, you shouldn't go down that track. That's a dangerous place to go, place to go and so forth. But the reality is we need to go there if we're going to experience our fear. And so what we have to do then is go through this whole process of reducing all of these impediments to our feeling of our own fear. Mm -hmm. And these impediments are all a, a series of false beliefs that we have imbibed from the society and the world around us and that are now a part of us. False beliefs such as, I'm not able to feel all of my fear. My fear will completely overwhelm me and I'll be so emotionally distraught that I'll feel like I'm going crazy. So a fear of going nuts is going to also cause us to not allow ourselves to feel our fear. Then there's also a lot of emotions about being humiliated when we're in a state of fear. And often people do choose to humiliate us when we feel fear. Also, uh, generally, our body is shaking when we feel fear. And, and most people around us who are terrified of feeling their own fear look at a person whose body is shaking and go, if you haven't got some kind of disease, then there's something wrong with you. <laughs> you know, they want the, to associate it with some kind of disease some kind of motor neuron, neuron mm -hmm. disease uh, rather than actually go, no, you, you, you're actually having a feeling of fear, right? Yeah. And so people get very stressed out around it. And you've got to go through all of those impediments of all the people and what they think about your feeling of your fear. And once you've done all of that, then you'll probably get to your fear. <laughs> and, and so, um, and, but the, and that is a process and it's a very different process for each individual because each individual has had a different history each individual has have a different home life and a different society life uh, and so it depends on which country we are as to wh what you know the viewpoints will happen as well and and what was suppressed and what is allowed and so forth so it just depends upon the environment that we've grown up in as to how we get to that point but but it will go through those processes that I've mentioned so you've just described all of the different resistances we might have to experiencing fear that essentially other fears of what would ha what would happen yeah many of them will be beliefs as well which mm -hmm. have entered us as an emotional belief we believe it so strongly that we have an emotional reaction when somebody challenges that belief so all of those beliefs that we carry around fear are they the things that cause us to justify fear or live in fear yes they they are the the belief systems that we have that are all false around around our fear are the things that cause our fear to be completely locked down and and so what we choose to do then is instead of experiencing the fear we choose to live in it or what i mean by that is we choose the, the fear is really uh, the underlying emotion that needs to be felt. And then on top of that, we have created a whole series of addictions so that we don't have to face these fears. Mm. And these series of addictions can be anything from substances right the way through to emotions and relationships even, and an entire life to avoid the fear. And in fact, so most people on the planet have created, when they first realise this, they have actually created an entire life in addiction to avoid their fears. Mm -hmm. And once you start going through and breaking all of that down, of course your life has to change. And most people are terrified of that as well because some people like their life as they are because it helps them avoid all of their fears. <laughs> they <laughs> think it's happy when really they just feel comfortable and safe. Yeah, that's yeah. right. It's all about safety and security. If you, you ask the average woman in, a, woman in a relationship what's the primary reason why she's in a relationship, and for many women it would be a feeling of safety and security if if we were all that honest perhaps if we were all <laughs> honest yeah, yeah. The, the problem of course with fear is very few people are honest about it yeah. and that, that'll justify you know all sorts of things you know we had a discussion last night where a person is just shutting themselves down completely shutting down every desire and they're telling themselves they don't know why they feel numb but why they feel numb is because they are unwilling to feel their fear and they know all this fear is in there now Yes. And now they're trying to shut it all down, and so they suppress their fear, shut down. That shuts down everything, shuts down desire as well. And now they feel numb. They're just going through life like this in a bit of a daze, 
and, and it's a very uh, even angry state uh, surrounding the fear, not wanting to go into the fear. And then going, oh, you know, everything's pretty hard to see, I don't know. Then you start developing doubts as well, because this is what fear does, you know, you start, oh, I don't know if it's the truth anymore, I don't know if it's the right thing to do, and, and off we go down this track. And before we know it, we've convinced ourselves to completely take a different course of action in our life other than a passionate course of action, you know, to have a passionate life. And the main reason why we've done that has got nothing to do with the fact that we like it. It's got everything to do with the fact of what we're, how terrified we are and what we want to avoid. Mm. So from what you're saying, um, if I was to launch into uh, living my life not in fear but dealing with fear, mm -hmm. I would be looking at these addictions but something interesting that you just talked about then was taking action. And is that another way that we can start to challenge ourselves to experience fear rather than live in it? Yeah, I feel it's one of the best ways of experiencing fear, actually, is to, is to write down a list of everything that you intellectually know you're afraid of. And, and to be frank, the majority of the list, if we're honest with ourselves, will turn out to be emotions mm -hmm. rather than actually events or circumstances or situations. Right? Yes. So most of our fears uh, revolve around certain emotions, actually, you know, that we are afraid of experiencing, that we feel we cannot experience, that we will be overwhelmed or we'll be so, uh, we won't be able to cope with the underlying feeling. And so, and so our majority of our fears are all about emotions in the end. But if, even if we wrote down all of our fears about situations that we're afraid of, and then we chose every single day to have one of those situations occur, yes. right? And, you know, and particularly when these situations are, are, are not uh, what I would classify to be damaging to us again. So, so if we're afraid of rape, I'm not suggesting that you go and get yourself raped just so that you can feel the fear of being raped. I, but if you're afraid of opening your heart to a person, right, then I definitely would suggest that you, you, know, you choose a person who you feel attracted to and, and start developing a relationship and let yourself open your heart and see where it takes you. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Like, Absolutely. So you know, there are obvious fears that we have that it would be unwise to uh, you know, attract the situation um, to, to confront the fear, but, but there are literally hundreds of fears that we have that we can completely attract the fear. Uh, you know, attract the situation, and actually, it would be positive for us to attract the situation, mm -hmm. and and actually desire the situation so that we work through the potential fear. But we shouldn't go through it in a in a way of I'm going to conquer this fear feeling. This is the way people go through it often. So they they have a situation, and it's all about conquering the fear. No, it's not. It's all about experiencing the fear, which is a softening to the fear, yes. not a feeling of anger towards the fear and that you're going to control survive. it and survive and suppress yeah. it. And, and so if we go into this process of confronting our fears with the other attitude, this angry attitude of conquering the fear, then in the end it won't benefit us uh, at all. We'll still have all the fears inside of us after we've finished all of the events we've had on our list. If we go into it as uh, into every single situation, like even if we're just afraid of something like speaking up in a situation with men or women, then when a situation comes up where, where I have a different opinion and there's a group of men or women there, I'd speak up mm -hmm. and, and, and let what happens happens and go, ah, that's the reason why I'm so afraid of this particular event, you know, because I got attacked there and I was condescended to there and I don't want to feel those feelings. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it, we can literally m make a list of hundreds of our fears if we wanted to and actually go through the process of creating situations or being conscious of situations we are already creating, because that's usually the case anyway, and, and allowing ourselves to actually feel and experience the fear and the reason why we have it in those particular situations. Mm. And that's very, very different than going into it with an attitude, I'm gonna conquer this fear, so I'm gonna become a public speaker, I'm afraid of public speaking, I'm going to become a public speaker no matter how hard it is like you know that kind of feeling is not softening to the experience of your fear once you experience your fear of public speaking for example and you realize what it's all about and most of the time that is about people thinking you're an idiot the way people look at you how they condescend towards you as you're speaking and all those other things they're all to do with people's perception and opinion of you once you release those fears you'll be able to get up in front of an audience who's throwing throw eggs at you and you'll still be able to say what you're yeah. <laughs> what you want to say without without having any fear.
Yeah. Yeah, and I suppose I, I'm reflecting on my own experience in the last four years, mm. even mm. Um, as you're speaking about these things, and my own attitudes to fear and my living in fear, and it very much feels like when um, when I recognised, even intellectually, that I had so much fear in me, I did go into this place knowing okay I've got to deal with it and it was almost an anger about having fear and mm. and a bullying of myself to get through experiences mm. and I got through some experiences and I didn't grow at all mm. and and I've had to had have many more experiences of the same type of the same type in order to to really soften into the into the experience yeah. and and now I feel like I'm even less as you were mentioning less afraid of experiences and events it's like appealing back and I, I'm getting through some of those fears and now I'm left with this very raw terror of actual emotions inside yeah. of me and when we confront our fears that's what it's going to be like and in the end we'll go through this angry place probably where we want to control them and confront them that way and then we'll realize that that never released anything and then we'll get to the point where we soften to them and allow ourselves to you know be out of control which is all and then you allow yourself to experience it it's, it's like remaining present during mm -hmm. the experience yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I feel that, you know, that's where most people will go in that same direction eventually. Um, I see a lot of people who believe they have no fear at all, so they're in complete denial of it, or they acknowledge their fears without having any desire to actually feel their way through them. And both of those places are complete lack of humility, and they're also living in the fear. So every single day your life will be creating things to, to, to actually begin to expose this fear to yourself. And, uh, or you've actually created an entire life to prevent anything from being exposed to yourself. And this final question on mm -hmm. fear, obviously mm -hmm. it's a big theme for me, sorry, but um, you mentioned the, the magic kind of relationship between fear and desire. Mm -hmm. And when we live in fear, we're basically desireless. Um, but something that I'd love your input on is that I'm recognising lately is that when I'm led by desire into experiences, then my fear is released from me more naturally. If I decide um, not, for example, with public speaking, right, I'm afraid of public speaking, so I'm just going to go and do it and get up there and do it, nothing much seems to happen. Mm -hmm. But if I feel in my heart and I think... You know, I'd really love to share divine truth with people. Or I'd really love to share the subject of cooking with people. Yeah, or, 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 or whatever subject, it is. Whatever it is, yes. bike riding or <laughs> how to make a car or whatever the subject oh, is. And I've got this idea of how to do that. Yeah. It's going to involve public speaking. Yeah. But if I go into it led by a desire that's more loving, mm -hmm. my fear seems to exit me more naturally. That is only the case under one circumstance, right. though. And what that is, is that? when the desire is greater than the fear. Mm. So so if our fear is greater than our desire, what will happen is our desires will be completely suppressed by the fear. We will not act upon them. What we need to do is grow our desires enough and lessen our fear enough through understanding the truth about fear, lessen our fear enough so that our desire exceeds our fear. Once our desire exceeds our fear, we will definitely go ahead and do something that we're afraid of. And our fear is no longer our God. What we desire becomes more important to us than what we fear. So that's the magic uh, um, sliding scale, isn't it? Because exactly. Because many people are frozen with desire under fear. That's correct. So is the answer to grow desire? Well, it's to, to do both. To do both. It's always to do both. Grow the desire so that, so that you feel your desire and you feel passionate about your desire, you see how important your desire is, you see where, what it might give you. In other words, you're going to have to have some faith about the future and where, where your desire will take you. And you're going to have some trust, that, you know, you, so you develop these qualities that help support your desire. And then at the same time, you start chipping away at the untruth mm -hmm. related to your fear. And so you need to chip away at it enough so that, so, so that your, your fear starts going down and your desire starts going up. Now, once they pass that equilibrium point and the desire exceeds the fear, now you will act. And, and it will be a natural action. It won't be something you've been pushing yourself into doing, trying hard to do, but it will be a natural action that can be taken.
Yeah. Thank you. Thank but it's a, it's a big, big block to humility, fear. And in fact, if you look at many of the other things we've discussed, you know, like things like anger, for example, that all comes from fear anyway. And if you look at hatred, that all comes from fear. And, you know, so these blocks to humility, many of them are actually fear based in nature. Um, even though I think the next one you're going to raise is well, all fear-based in nature Yeah, as well. that's what I was going to raise something related to fear, which is doubt, okay, um, so. which we don't often necessarily associate as a fearful experience. But So um, my question is, what is doubt? Um, I don't know, know whether doubt is a feeling. I, I sort of feel more like doubt is a state that we place ourselves in, or, or to be more specific, that our fear places us in, in order to prevent us from taking actions. Mm. In other words, we often doubt when we're in a situation where we don't know what to do, we don't know what action to take. And most of the time we're in that place is because there is no seeming good outcome from any of the possible actions. So what we do inside of ourselves when we're faced with any choice or decision is we have a situation or circumstance appear, there appears to be no choice that will end up with a happy or, or you know, joyful outcome for us. And so what we do is we do not want to make any choice. We, we go into a state of inaction. We don't want to take a decision just in case that decision may cause our situation to become even worse. And when we do not see any potential positive for any of our choices or decisions, what we decide to do then is to support that state, to support the state of inaction. And doubt causes us to be able to support the state of inaction. We don't have to act upon anything when we're in the state of doubt. And we don't have to get ourselves out of the state of doubt. In fact, we will have all sorts of justifications to ourselves in the state of doubt. We'll say to ourselves, oh, it's impossible to know the truth about that. Or, no, it's impossible to act upon that because no matter what happens, it's going to turn out bad. Mm. Um, and, and so we don't see any light, if you like, at the end of the tunnel. In fact, doubt is closely related to the emotion of hope in the sense mm. that if we feel hopeless, we will often create many doubts to support our hopelessness. Mm. When we have hope, then it causes us to actually have a desire to act in, a, in one direction. But when we, there is no hope, we often then have no no idea what to do, no idea what we can, what actions we can take. And would you say that hope is related to faith? C certainly, faith, hope, love are all very, very uh, closely related to each other, along with courage, integrity, and other emotions. Are all all of these what the human race views as positive emotions are all very closely related to each other in that they support each other. Uh -huh. Uh, doubt is one of these emotions that supports our fear mm. and so it causes us to have indecision and um, and to not be able to finish up making choices that will actually produce positive or any outcome in our life actually mm. um, yeah and and from what you're saying it sounds like doubt is actually a place we go to when we want to avoid any emotional experience and avoid any action, action. Um, so, so, and and in the place of doubt, we attract other people who have the same doubts. I, I don't know if anybody's ever noticed that, but but that's normally what happens. So, so when you start expressing these doubts and feeling these doubts that you actually have, all of a sudden there's like heaps of spirits and people on earth who just gather around you and say, "Yeah, it is like that, isn't it?" And yeah, that's how I feel too. And yeah, and so now we have a support group for our doubt, <laughs> um, which is which is a support group for us to have no action yeah. so so i often see many groups that have been created on earth you know are actually supporting each other to have no action to to remain in a state of doubt just to talk up a talk and talk and talk without doing anything so are you saying that when we're in a state of doubt we can't ever reach a resolution is that inherent in the state well, we, well the only the, the fastest way to tr to trigger doubt i feel is to act like, you know, take, taking an action will actually help us with our doubt. But we need to understand what, what is the underlying cause of our doubt. The underlying cause of our doubt is our resistance. So a lack of humility towards our own fear. That's the underlying lying cause of doubt. It's a resistance or a lack of humility towards taking action in our life, to being responsible for our life, for our personal life. 
Now, God is trying to teach us constantly to take responsibility for our personal life. And we're often in the state where we feel like, oh, well, if I do that, then this will happen and I don't like that outcome. If I do that, this will happen and I don't like that outcome. If I do that, this will happen and I don't like that outcome. So it's better for me just to say, I don't know what to do. And then I don't have to choose any of those potential outcomes. And if I can give more practical situation. So you might be in a relationship that where you're having lots of fights and arguments. And fights and arguments are always caused by each person, usually in the relationship, not wanting, or at least one of the persons in a relationship, not wanting to, to be humble, not wanting to look at the actual emotion that exists within themselves, right? And so, so what we do in this relationship is we fight, we fight, we fight. Now, th obviously, um, we like fighting. Or we wouldn't do it. Or we wouldn't do it. Yeah. Right? And one of the reasons why we like fighting is because fighting gets us out of acting any differently. We don't have to do something different. It's something that we're comfortable with. Right? And we don't have to do anything different. We don't have to come to a resolution of why we are fighting. Right? And, and doubt causes us to, uh, to, to avoid the underlying reasons of, as to why we're fighting. We can focus on unfortunately and many people do in a relationship is they focus on the problem being the fight and the subject of the fight rather than seeing that actually it's all about the avoidance of specific emotions inside of themselves that they're in fear of feeling and their inability to make a choice different is due to their doubt mm -hmm. that they don't know what different choice they can make only because they don't like the potential outcomes of the different choices so for example if you're fighting and you choose differently you could choose to walk away but why don't you walk away? There's got to be a reason that, that you, it will turn out to be uncomfortable or for you. Mm -hmm. So what, you, what do you choose? You could sit there and take the other person's rage with that and feel how bad that feels. But why don't you want to do that? Oh, because that means that I'll be humiliated or somebody you know be harming me and I want to defend myself and I want to be rebellious to that or something like that. So I don't like that outcome. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I could choose to separate from the person. Oh, then all my emotional insecurities and all my financial insecurities are all triggered. So that doesn't seem like a very good outcome. So what am I left with? Fighting. Mm. And I'll stay in fighting for as long as it takes for me to realise that I have another choice. <laughs> but I don't want to take any of those choices, and so I'd rather doubt that those choices will ever lead me anywhere. So I say, oh, that won't work, that won't work, that won't work, that won't work, and I'm left with fighting. And I like that. So you're really saying fighting, perpetual fighting, is being in a state of doubt? Well, it's about, it's about resistance to taking another action. Mm -hmm. And, and the only reason why we would resist taking another action is because we're afraid. Mm -hmm. And so, and the only reason why we don't want to act is because we're afraid. And, and in between the two feelings, like the fear and the fighting, is our doubt that any other action will actually fix the problem. Yes. Yeah. Right? And, and so we don't believe the actual problem will be fixed. We feel, have a feeling of hopelessness associated with the problem actually being repaired. And we feel that, and we keep doing the same thing over and over. The definition of you know, stupidity, same thing over and over again. We keep doing it because we do not wish to take another action. Mm. And therefore we lack humility. Right? Yeah, mm. okay. A couple more questions about doubt yep. itself. Yep. Um, in this postmodernist world, I've heard it said that doubt is actually a good thing. <laughs> yeah, doubt, doubt has become a, an attractive bohemian uh, lifestyle attribute, basically. A mark of your A mark your of a person's intellectual prowess and philosophical state. Yeah. Uh, and the reality is, no, it just has masked a whole heap of fears that the majority of those people do not want to face. They don't want to face that they don't know the answers or they don't want to face that the answers are not very pleasant, mm. for example. And so we can then go into a state of, oh, maybe this is true, maybe that's true, but I don't know. And when I don't know, I don't have to make any decision. I don't have to make any choice. I don't have to actually do something to fix the problem. I can just keep uh, remaining in this place for as long as it takes, mm. for as long as it takes often is our entire life. Unfortunately, and this is how uh, how the world stays in ver in a state of very little change because the majority of people love to feel that there is no solution. 
Mm. Because a solution requires them to change mm. and they don't want to change and they're afraid of change. Mm. And why are they afraid of change? Because they're afraid of all the emotions involved in change, right? And so what they do is they then go into a state of, oh, I doubt that there's any solution. Right? Now I can, I can live in this state of hopelessness and justify it completely to myself as a state of inaction and therefore nothing around me will change. The world won't change either in that state. And I can talk about, philosophize about how the world is and isn't it terrible how it is, and yet I am a primary contributor by remaining in my fear to taking action and by justifying my doubt to myself. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And often um, I, I, f I seem to see that the idea of having a firm belief is considered to be naive and that doubt is is somehow um, seen to be synonymous with questioning. And from what you're saying, questioning and doubt are two very different things. Yeah, doubt is a place where you've already made up your mind. It's not a questioning attitude. You've already made up your mind because there is no, you've already made up your mind there is no good outcome. Mm. There is no outcome that isn't going to trigger a fear that you have inside of yourself. And so you've already made up your mind as to what the truth is and that there is no truth on the particular issue. That's what you've actually decided inside of yourself when you're in a state of doubt. You've already decided there is no truth and you're just trying to look for some justification of that being true. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the opposite of asking a question. It's really. the opposite of asking yeah. a question. Um, a person who asks a question like a child, you look at how a child learns. The reason why a child learns so rapidly is a child has no doubt to fight with through the process of learning. Generally, it has very little fear associated with learning for the same, you know, and therefore it creates no doubt. It creates no desire to not act. It, it, it's going to act upon what it learns. A mm -hmm. child knows that. Every single day it acts on what it learns from the moment it gets up. Like, you, you look at how a child learns to walk. It gets up, wiggles, wobbles, wobbles, wiggles, wobbles, wobbles bang, hits its head, bop, cries, feels the emotion. It's not afraid of being hurt. It's not afraid of any falling down the stairs. Even though it can't walk, it's still not afraid of falling down the <laughs> stairs. And it falls down the stairs or it falls, and it bumps and bangs. It's got all these injuries and bruises, but it gets up again every single time because it's just released the emotion associated with it. It still has no fear. It doesn't sit there and say, I doubt whether I was created to walk. Yeah. <laughs> I doubt whether I was created to walk because I'm having so many injuries yes, while yeah. it's happening. Yeah. Like, it doesn't say that at all. It no. doesn't use any intellectual process like that. What it does instead is it allows itself to go through a process and, and it, you know, it, it stands, wobbles, falls over, gets hurt. Mm -hmm. And even when it gets hurt, it doesn't hold on to the hurt. It mm -hmm. just has a big cry. You know, usually mum or daddy gives it a hug as well, you know, it gets a bit of love as well in the process. And, and five minutes later, where is it again? In the same situation standing up again. <laughs> like yeah. in the, and often in the same dangerous situation yeah. standing up again and having the same dangerous effect. And, and, until it, and, and it processes its hurt every single, single time. And eventually it learns how to walk. Mm. And once it learns how to walk, it has confidence, you know, it's got all the confidence and usually, and usually this happens within a period of like three months for the, or less for the average child. With three months, its life has changed, mm. right? Now, if we had the same action as adults as that, we would learn very rapidly and we would also do very many more powerful things than we are currently doing if we had that attitude. The problem though is that majority of us don't do that. We are so afraid of being hurt, and the child isn't. Mm. The child gets a hurt, bang, hurts itself, has a big cry, it's all gone. The hurt's even gone. It, it can go and play and laugh after it's been hurt, after it's had that cry, because it's released the fear associated with it. And once it's done that, it then acts again, acts again, acts again. It continually acts. And, and we grow up thinking we're now adults and we're all, you know, like bohemian and, and, and uh, you know, worldly, worldly, yeah. worldly and, uh, and we, we've got all of these lovely qualities and one of them is our philosophical doubt and, you know, we hold on to this as if it's some kind of sign of our development of maturity and yeah. sometimes a sign of our growth. But the reality is it's a sign that we're in a state where we do not want to act and we do not want to make a decision. Mm -hmm. That's the sign. Mm -hmm. And no growth ever happens unless we... Cannot happen. Yeah. Yeah. And in this state of doubt, we are complete, we lack humility to every other emotion in that state. 
we even even lack the humility to feeling our emotions of a lack of hope, for example. A feeling that no matter what I do, I'll fail. Mm -hmm. No matter what I do, I will be unhappy. Now, these are very strong feelings of grief that exist within the average person that we that we get to not feel because we can stay in uh, we can stay in this state of doubt and philosophize about our state of doubt in order to avoid those emotions so if i found myself in a state of doubt i would need to recognize that i'm actually just avoiding some other emotion that i'm afraid of doubt is an addiction covering our fear Mm -hmm. and uh, and so we need to see it as such it's, an, it's something that we're addicted to so that we do not have to act. Great. It allows us to remain in two or three or five or 10 or 15 or 20 or 100 minds <laughs> you know, and never make a final choice or decision. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and many of us are totally afraid of making final choices and decisions. When, when we made decisions when we were younger, oftentimes if it was the wrong decision in terms of society's viewpoint or our parents' viewpoint, we got severely punished, many times violently. So we have a lot of fear of violence associated with our desire to doubt. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Okay. I just need to take a short break. Sure. And-